Hello, everyone. This is David Cerns with Haley Marketing, and welcome to today's Lunch with Haley webinar. So we have a big crowd, uh, many of whom are just still logging in. So I'll go slowly with the intro to give everybody a little extra time. Um, this is probably our biggest registration amount in more than a year. Um, and it's not a surprise because we're looking at strategies to help you sell more. So the official title of today's presentation, 10X Sales Acceleration, Using Marketing to Reimagine Your Sales Process. But I think a better title might be um, How to Sell a Lot More Without Making More Cold Calls. So we're going to talk today in a fair amount of detail about strategies, tactics to help you be more effective in selling in the current market. I know it's tough. I We've been listening to interviewee and podcast guest and webinar host after webinar host talking about what's going on in the economy and trying to figure this all out. And even back at the Staffing Industry Executive Forum a few weeks ago was trying to really understand how can it be that the economic data looks so good, unemployment's low, GDP growth is up. And almost everybody we're seeing in the staffing industry is struggling to get more clients. So I don't know that I ever got a clear answer on that. I've heard a lot of different theories. I heard a theory that, well, it's because a lot of the GDP growth is coming from government spending. So that's interesting. I actually saw another presenter who said a lot of the lower wage blue collar jobs are now being filled by immigrants who are not going through staffing services. That's an interesting take. I'm not sure what it is, but the good news is there's still a lot of business out there. There's still a lot of opportunity. And another takeaway from the Staffing Industry Executive Forum is that despite where we are now, growth in the staffing industry is predicted to continually grow year after year after year because the demand for talent outpaces the supply, uh, I think it's probably for almost 10 more years that we're going to have this issue. So how can we actually help drive sales? Let's talk about that today. So I want to explain something that a lot of you probably already know. Some of you who may have never met me may not know this, but I grew up in a family-run staffing company. In fact, that's my dad. Uh, his name is Rick Cerns. And um, this presentation is actually a little bit of a tribute to him. So my dad passed in 2021. Um, he and my mom ran a staffing company for more than 30 years. And my dad uh, was kind of old school. And when people would come to him in various tough times in the economy and say, how do we get sales? He'd simply say, you want to make more sales? Make more calls. And he'd literally hand people a phone book and say, there's your lead list. This was a while ago. All right. And then some of you may know this guy. Uh, this guy is Mike Jackatote. He's a partner with Butler Street. And last, I think it was September, um, I think we had his partner, Mary McLaughlin, on the Smart Ideas Summit, our annual day-long virtual event. And one of the things that Mike and Marianne said, I'm going to attribute it to Mike because I heard it from him first, is that it said, in times like this, to succeed in a down market, you have to do two times the work for one half the results. Ick. Well, I don't think Mike's wrong. I don't think my dad was wrong. But hey, I know this guy. He's wearing a different shirt than the guy talking right now, but I recognize him. And I have a quick confession for you all. So my confession, I seriously hate cold calling. I don't like calling anyone. It's not something I do. I kind of got into marketing because I hate cold calling. I had a job before this where I had to pick up the phone all day long and make calls, and I was terrible at it. And I don't just hate cold calling, but I don't want to do four times the work to basically stay where I am today. And so what we're going to talk about today is how can we do something different? There is an alternative to just make more calls. Now, I need to put an asterisk on that, a disclaimer. That doesn't mean you're not going to make calls. It doesn't mean you shouldn't pick up the phone. No, quite the contrary. You need to do both. Pick up the phone. You probably need to make a little more calls. You need to definitely make more deliberate calls. And that's what we're going to talk about to do it today is 
how to use marketing to make your sales process more efficient and more effective. All right, but first, let's start with a quick story. So this story is, we're going to, going back in time, we're going to time travel all the way back to 1993. And I don't want to hear from how many of you weren't even born then, um, but back in 1993, I was not in the staffing industry at this point in time. I actually owned a startup that was in the world of technology because I have an IT background. And I happened to hear this guy. His name was Jim Cecil. And Jim was a self-proclaimed nurture marketing expert. So Jim told this fantastic story. And I, I want you to, I can't see you, so I'm just going to have to trust you on this, but I want you to close your eyes for just a minute. And I want you to just imagine something. Now, imagine you're in South America. You're trekking through the jungle, and I want you to think full out Indiana Jones here. You're hacking through the brush. There's your machete as you're trying to make your way forward, but then all of a sudden, bam, you get hit right in the chest with a spear. Well, at that precise moment in time, what goes through your mind? Now, if you were in human resources, you might say, well, what's going through my mind right now is I need to put together an RFP and I need to reach out to at least five spear removal surgeons, um, provide the qualifications that are required, get their estimates back in, and we will pick the vendor that gets us the lowest bid. Yeah, that's not what you're doing when you're trekking through the jungle. And what Jim said is when that spear hits you, what you're thinking at that precise moment in time is, who can get this out of me and not kill me in the process? So the metaphor that Jim was using is the same one we see in business today, is that our clients are catching spears every single day. We call them problems. Our clients have problems with the quality of their workforce. Our clients have problems with getting work done. Our clients have problems with deadlines. Our clients have problems with risk management. Our clients have problems with productivity. And when they have these problems, the question is, is your company the trusted spear removal surgeon? Are you the company that's top of mind? Are you the company that becomes the first call? And if the people you're calling on already have five staffing vendors, you know inevitably one of those vendors at some point is going to make a mistake and will you be the first call then? So what Jim was, was talking about here is how do you use nurture marketing to become the trusted spear removal surgeon? Now, in listening to Jim, um, I took home several lessons that I think are every bit as true today as they were back in 1993. Number one is you need to paint bullseye on the target to really know who you're going after. And I find that very often in staffing, we paint a really big bullseye that says, well, anybody that needs to hire is my target. We're going to talk in a little bit about why that's not such a great strategy. Number two, you have to become that trusted spear removal surgeon. And what does that mean? It means you're positioning yourself as someone who's really good at solving specific kinds of problems. What are the spears you know how to take out? Who's the patient? Who's catching those spears? What type of company? Where are they located? What size? What types of decision makers? What's their attitude towards staffing? And how do we become trusted to those people? We'll talk about that in a little bit. Number three, you have to make deposits before asking for a withdrawal. So when we're selling, we're asking people to take time out of their day to read our email, to take time out of their day to get on the phone or a Zoom meeting, to take time out of their day to have an in-person appointment. Those are withdrawals. We're asking them to give us something. Now, in exchange, the first thing we want to do is put deposits in. So think about it like a bank account. We're trying to put deposits in before we take the withdrawal out. And the deposits we're going to put in are the things that we do to position our business to become the trusted spear removal surgeon, or surgeon, to add value, to position our company appropriately, to
to make someone want to work with us. I love this one. Now, this is back in 1993, and Jim said it takes six touches to get someone's attention. In 2024, I actually just saw data on it this week, where they said it was 12 to 14 touches to get someone's attention because so many people are bombarding us with messaging. I know if your inbox looks anything like mine, it's insane. There is an offer a minute coming in. And then what Jim also said is that if you want to become top of mind, it takes about nine touches. Today, it's probably more like 20 touches to become top of mind. But here's the killer. 90% of salespeople give up in less than four attempts and 50% give up after one no. So we need to change that. And if you take nothing out of today's presentation, just take these four bullets and think about how would we approach the market differently? But of course, I want to give you more value than just those four bullets. And what can you do now? It's 2024. What can you do to apply Jim Cecil's nurture marketing in today's world? What still holds up? Well, I'm going to go back to the uh, the executive form data. And you may have seen the, the SIA and Bullhorn staffing indicator. And so this shows the year over year change in hours being built in the staffing industry. And you can see there's commercial and there's professional and overall US staffing. And they're all at a tie as of this March, down 13%. So overall we're down and you can see we've been down for months, um, way off of our 2021 peak. So right now the market looks weak, but if ours are down 13%, the corollary to that is 87% of staffing hours of staffing billing is still taking place. And now it's all more a matter of, well, are we going to lose 13% like the rest of the market? Or are we going to lose more? Or are we going to lose less? And that's going to be a recurring theme today is it's your choice what happens to your company in the market because you know, unless you're a big global brand, you are not dependent on the overall economy. You're dependent on what happens with your clients in your local office. Or if you're a salesperson or a recruiter, you're dependent on what happens on your desk. So how do you increase sales in a market like this? The rest of today's presentation, our time together is going to be spent on three things, three secrets to success, three broad categories of things that I want you to take home. Uh, the first secret to success is to build a better strategy. And in a minute, we'll go through what that means and how you do it. The second secret to success is to build a better sales process. There are about 20,000 staffing companies just in the United States throw in another 3,000 plus more in Canada, and uh, I don't know how many in Mexico, but uh, we'll, we'll take the US and Canada part of North America, and it's 23,000 companies who pretty much are all using just about the same playbook for selling, the same methodologies, the same processes. So if you want your sales to be different or seem different than everybody else, you need your process to not look like everybody else. And of course, I wouldn't be a marketing guy if I didn't say you need better marketing. But the practical reality is marketing plays a bigger role in staffing today than it ever has. Back in 1993, when I heard about Jim Cecil, marketing was non-existent in the staffing industry. People made calls, period. In 1993, nobody had a website. They didn't even know what a website was. Now we have all kinds of marketing technology. We have more ways to reach people than ever before and more ways for staffing decision makers, the buyers of your services to avoid you than ever before. It's easy to dodge a sales call. So we need a better approach to marketing and integration of marketing and sales if we want our sales to be successful. All right, so let's go through these in a little more detail. And by the way, I didn't mention this earlier. I see one question has popped up in the chat. I'll check it from time to time, but it's just me on here and I'm going to try to focus on the presentation, but it will leave time at the end for, for Q&A and there'll be contact information. If I miss anything, don't be shy. Just reach out. Always happy to answer questions. Okay. So let's talk about creating a better strategy. So 
What I want you to think about is thinking beyond immediate hiring needs. And we're seeing a lot of people act out of almost a sense of desperation. I need job orders right now. That's hard. You may find that a lot of companies you're calling on just don't need you right now. But it doesn't mean they won't need you next week or maybe next month or maybe in three months, maybe not even for a year, but they will need you. And if your strategy has a long-term horizon as opposed to only focusing on immediate sales, over that long-term horizon, you will be far better off than your competitors. So the first part of that long-time horizon is picking your focus. It's that bullseye on the target. Who are your ideal clients? Now, when I'm working on marketing strategy with our clients, I always ask, tell me who your ideal client is. Who is it that you most want to do business with? And the answer I receive back most commonly, well, everybody can use staffing services. So I don't have just one ideal client. So then I have to follow up my first question with the second one. Well, okay, of the companies you do business with, which ones do you like to work with the most? What are common characteristics about those companies? Are they the ones who spend the most? Are they the ones in a certain geographic market? Are they in a specific industry? Are there certain types of decision makers that you get along better with? Maybe you're better at selling to HR. Maybe you're better at selling to the direct line manager. Maybe you're better at selling to C-level executives. Maybe you're really good with frontline supervisors. But who are your ideal clients? Now, there may be more than one bullseye on the target, and that's okay. But what you don't want to do is say that the target is anyone and everyone, because there's a marketing truism that says, when you try to be all things to all people, you end up being nothing to everyone. So the more clearly you can define who it is you're selling to, the easier it is to determine what is your value proposition to that audience, what problems can you solve better than anybody else in the world. And it gives your sales team a huge leg up in marketing themselves, marketing your firm to those types of companies and individuals. Second, you have to match your message to the audience. Now, I've seen a lot of companies that are implementing these multi-touch email campaigns. And I am a huge fan of multi-touch campaigns. Not just email, you really need multi-channel, but we'll get back to that in a little bit. But what they're doing in these multi-touch campaigns is they're essentially saying over and over again, here's why my company is a better staffing provider. Here's why you should work with us because we're so good at what we do. Look at us, look at us, look at us. That's the message that's been going out. And for a lot of years, from like 2012, basically till 2022, brought COVID for a year for a bit. If you could find talent and you were any good at recruiting, you could get job orders, you could fill those job orders and your company would grow. It's 2024. A lot of the people you're calling on don't have the immediate need for a better staffing provider. They may like who they're working with. They may not have as much demand. They see no reason to add another vendor to their approved vendor list. So now you have to think about who am I calling on, that ideal client, and what matters to them. I got to crawl inside their brains and think what's keeping them up at night. How are they measured in their job? Where are their opportunities in their business that can help them achieve more? The more you understand that target customer and what motivates them, what gets them excited about their job, then you can show how staffing helps them accomplish their goals. And when companies are buying from you, the product or service they're buying may be temporary help or temp to hire, direct hire, executive recruiting. But what they're really buying is the outcome of what you do. And I, the analogy that I love to use is, you know, let's say you go to a Home Depot store and you buy a quarter inch drill bit. When you buy that quarter inch drill bit, what is it that you really want? Now, I ask that question when I'm at a conference up on stage. And very often the first answer I get from people is, well, I bought a quarter inch drill bit because I wanted a quarter inch drill bit. It's like, no, you didn't. What you wanted was a quarter inch hole, but Home Depot doesn't sell those. Now that's kind of silly, but think about staffing. None of your clients are out there going, 
oh, I really just want to go get another temporary employee. What they're thinking about is I've got a warehouse that needs to get stuff out the door. I've got a software project that needs to be completed by a certain deadline, or I'm trying to implement new technologies or cybersecurity. I've got an engineering project that needs to get done. I've got a hospital that needs to be adequately staffed. They're thinking about what are their business outcomes and how is staffing a tool to achieve those outcomes. And your messaging has to really to be to show people that you understand the problems and that you can help them use staffing as a tool to accomplish their goals. That staffing in and of itself is not what they're buying. They're buying the outcome of staffing. I think I learned to tell better stories. There's another sales adage that says, best story wins. It's not best product, it's not best service, it's who tells the best story. And you need to think about storytelling in terms of what will capture the eyes and ears of the target ideal client, because you want to tell stories that captivate. And we're going to go through a little bit about how you do that using a model uh, called ADA that we'll talk about in just a minute, but you need to become expert storytellers. Um, if you've never read the book Story Branding, it's a good time to pick up a copy with Donald Miller. Um, but it's really the process of how your customer needs to be a hero in their own story. And your job as their vendor is to be their guide. If you're a Star Wars geek, um, you think about your customer is Luke Skywalker. You're Yoda. You're there to train them, show them how to be successful use the force, use the staffing force to accomplish their goals. And when you can tell stories that make people see themselves as the hero, then they are much more likely to be interested in whatever the solution is that you are selling and you can provide. All right, I mentioned Ada. So this is a framework for how to sell. It is like marketing 101 and it's this diagram. ADA stands for, it's an acronym, Awareness or Attention, Interest, Desire, Action. So in selling, we want to start at the bottom. I want to make calls and I want appointments. I want the action that someone has said, yes, meet with me. They've agreed to appointment. They've agreed to get on Zoom. They've agreed to talk to me. But before your client, your prospect is going to agree to an action, they have to have a desire for that action. Why? What's in it for them? Those people are busy. Why would they take time out of their day? And most times we start selling, we start right at the level of desire. Let me tell you why we're so great, why you should want to work with me. But that's too far down this funnel. If I really want to sell to somebody, the first thing I need to do is get their attention. We see thousands of marketing messages a day, thousands of sale pitches. They're coming in your email. They're coming in in social media. They're coming in in the real world outdoors. Now they're coming in directly as voicemail messages. There are actually services that you can get that will send a message directly to somebody's voicemail box without the phone ever ringing. You can send text messages. So how do you make your company stand out, get someone's attention? This is where you have to think, what are my competitors doing? Are they all just sending email? then maybe I need to do something different. I need to do something bolder, bigger. I need to do something for, so that for my small group of ideal prospects, I can guarantee I get their attention. Now, getting at somebody's attention is one thing. It could be, I, I've joked with people, like if I wanted to get your attention, I could put on a gorilla suit and jump up and down in front of you and you're, jump up on your desk and I'd get your attention and I get immediately escorted out by security. So when we get someone's attention, we immediately have to pivot to getting their interest. And interest to me is the most important part of this model. Desire comes out of interest. So what does interest mean? So let me, let me use another analogy. Uh, whatever city you're in while you're listening to this, I want you to visualize that uh, you're on a highway, a divided highway. So there's northbound lanes and southbound lanes. And you're driving on the northbound lanes. It's smooth sailing. There's an accident in the southbound lanes. And all of a sudden, the northbound lane screeched to a halt. What happened? There's no accident. Your lanes were clear. Well, you know what happened. Everybody did this. They rubbernecked. They turned. They had to look. What's going on? I have to pay attention to what's next to me. And as soon as everybody looks, they're tapping the brakes. And the person in front of you taps the brakes. The person in front of them taps the brakes. Everything slows down. So 
that need to turn and look at the accident. That's actually, it's not some sick problem we have. It's actually a basic human survival instinct. We are have been tuned since the days of the cavemen to look at and identify dangerous situations, problems. So when there's an accident near us, we have to see what's going on. Maybe it's a danger to us. We almost cannot look straight ahead and just keep driving. So how do you use that in selling? What are the accidents in the other lane that your customers are interested in? And the accidents are the problems they're dealing with. It's the things that keep them up at night. It's the things they worry the most about. It's the things that you can come in and show them how to solve using staffing as a tool. So when we're selling, when we're marketing, do something bold to get their attention or create awareness. And then you convert to the interest to show, hey, we understand the challenges you're facing, the pain of those challenges. And now we can convert to desire, which is, and when it comes to solving those particular problems, here's why we are the best in the world at delivering value. So this ADA model is the foundation for marketing and sales, because if we're doing this, more people will want to talk to us. So more of the, the D is where sales gets involved and starts making calls. More of the D actions turn into the real blue, the action of a meeting, an appointment. All right, another story. So this story is one that's going to be sound too good to be true, but it is true. Now, we're going to time travel again. This time, instead of going back to 1993, we're going back to 2010. So this is the story of a staffing company in Tennessee. And they were struggling to close deals. This company did a phenomenal job of getting appointments. They were actually really good at it. But in their local market, this, by the way, this company did light industrial staffing. And in their local market, the quality of the labor in general was not very good. So no call, no show, complete absenteeism, productivity were huge problems for temporary staffing companies back then. And what this company did is they said, we can solve this problem. And they built a recruiting process that would solve the problem, but it took a lot more effort than traditional recruiting. And this company, when their salespeople would go in and they'd get an appointment with an HR manager and they would talk to the HR manager about the challenges in the market and the ability to provide higher quality talent, the HR manager would be like, wow, that's fantastic. This is absolutely a problem we have. I'm glad you can solve it. However, your competitor down the street, they're 50 cents an hour less than you are. So unless you can drop your price, we're not going to work with you. And this poor staffing company and their salespeople were throwing up their hands saying, what do we do? We're getting the appointments. They like our value proposition, but they're not buying. So we said, well, let's look at the messaging. You're telling a good story. We're off to a great start. You're getting people's attention. They want to meet with you. They're interested in the value you can deliver, but they're not translating what you do into what really matters to them. And effectively, what they're saying is, I can pay less and get the same thing from someone else. Or the corollary, you're asking me to pay more money for what I perceive is the same outcome. So I asked the CEO of this company, I said, can you tell me why a company, an HR manager, should pay you more money for the same staffing services they can get from someone else? And to this lady's credit, she immediately rattled off, well, we can do A, B, C, and D. We have this phenomenal process. It results in a much higher performing temporary employee. He said, that's really interesting. I wonder if there's any research that's been done that helps demonstrate the value of higher performing temporary workers. And the answer was somebody did. There was academic research that had been done, and we were able to Google and find this research and dig into it. And again, this was 2010. So what I'm about to show you is not data you should rely on going forward. But when we did this research, we were able to find that there was a significant difference in the value of high-performing blue-collar workers versus average or low-performing. 
In fact, so much so that it, it had a very significant total annual productivity difference that we could measure in dollars and cents. Now, we decided to try to tell this story using a direct marketing campaign, and we were launching the campaign around Christmas time. So what comes at Christmas time? Everybody will tell you, never start a marketing campaign around Christmas because nobody's paying attention to work. And we said, yeah, but they're paying attention to Christmas cards. So we'll send people a card in the mail. And the card in the mail, when they open the envelope, looked a little like this. Can you afford to lose $22,800 in productivity per employee? From our research, we had learned that was the average loss in productivity for every single employee that was placed by one of those low-performing staffing companies. And the cool thing about this story is that it enabled our client, who already had a great message, great value proposition, to close the loop and demonstrate how they were delivering more value. They changed the message. So we're going to get back to what was the net outcome of that in a little bit. But I want you to think about this market, 2024. The same story won't work, but there's a different story that'll probably work. What's the biggest problem that's keeping your customers up at night? What's the impact of that pop problem? It can be in dollars and cents like this. It can be an emotional cost. Like I just can't deal with these low performing workers anymore. I was talking to another client of ours and that's exactly what we got to is, you know, her biggest, her client's biggest pain point was the lack of reliability in the workforce. And now we're gonna try to tackle how she could solve that problem. All right, so that's all about having a better strategy. Who am I going after? What's the right message? And how do I tell the story the right way? Now we got to have a better sales process. So you guys know this. I don't have to put this, but it's on screen. You know, staffing is almost never a one call close. We have to be playing a long game. So the reality of selling is that when we're calling on people, what we really want is somebody that wants to buy from us right now. And that's maybe 3% of the people who are in the market for staffing services. Then there's maybe another 6 to 7% that they're kind of unhappy with their current staffing partner. So maybe they'll be willing to talk to you about changing who they work with. Now, the data I'm showing you is not about the staffing industry. It actually comes from a book called The Ultimate Sales Machine by a guy named Chet Holmes. And this is any business to business selling. And I would argue right now in staffing, it's probably a lot less than 10% that are open to buying from you right now. It's probably less than 3%. But let's assume it's 10%. That means 90% of the people you're reaching out to are not looking for a new staffing partner. However, about a third of them, 30%, they're just not thinking about it. It's not top of mind. It's not a problem for them. Another 30%, you know, they're pretty happy with who they're working with. They, they don't think they'd be interested in somebody else because they have their own mind made up about what staffing companies do and the value staffing companies provide. So why would they want another one when they already know what you do? And then there's the bottom of the pyramid here, the 30% that they're definitely not interested. You could walk in giving away $300 bills and they will not do business with you. So when you're selling, obviously you want that top 3%. But the majority, that middle 60%, that's really where your future profits lie. The people who are not thinking about it because it's just not a problem they're having to deal with. And when staffing is not a problem, you don't look for a new vendor. Or they have preconceived notions and they don't see that you could be providing a different value. So they just think they're not interested. That middle 60% is where Jim Cecil talked about nurturing relationships. Those are the ones we work on today to become tomorrow's customer and next year's customers. And the ones that are going to become the profit drivers for you in the second half of 2024 and all of 2025 are the ones you're marketing to and building relationships with today. Your sales team should be spending most of their time in that top 10%, really focusing on people that are in the market right now. And you need a marketing, a nurture marketing function for that middle 60%. So what we talk about in marketing speak is building a sales funnel. So what's a sales funnel? This diagram shows it. Like there's three stages. You've got top of the funnel where people are just starting to learn about you. That may be the attention grabber and the interest grabber and the ADA model. 
the middle of the funnel where they're starting to, to look at you and you're starting to build that desire that they want to work with you. And the bottom of the funnel where you're helping your salespeople to improve productivity and make more, not, not just get the job orders, but close more placements. So the sales funnel, what it really is, is it's a model that outlines your customer's journey from the time they, they first come into contact with your business till they understand your value, till they see uh, what you really can do for them. And they start to develop that preference to work with you. And then there's another stage even beyond this. They have that repeat business. They keep wanting to work with you. Now, a sales funnel starts with really knowing your customer and identifying their problems because you're not going to get someone's attention in today's market unless you're addressing an, a pain point, a problem that your ideal customer is actively trying to deal with, something that you know they have all the time. We're going to use that problem as an attention grabber, the accident on the other side of the highway. We're going to use it to generate interest because when we look at the problem, our mind is engaged. We're paying attention. And that's the opportunity now to get them interested in how you can provide solutions. When we're providing solutions in the middle of the funnel, we're, we're educating some people on what's the real value of staffing. It's just, it's not just finding someone to do work by the hour. It's a tool to solve problems. Maybe it's a temporary or contract problem. Maybe it's a quality problem. Maybe it's a workforce reliability problem. Maybe it's a cost of labor problem. And then you're also going to get people to think, why you? What's different about how you approach staffing? About the kinds of customers you work with? About your expertise and your experience? About how quickly you get things done? About the return on investment that you deliver for your clients? And close the deal. The bottom of the funnel. This is where salespeople do their thing. This is where you prove your value. This is where you custom tailor your solutions to each prospect. This is where... You demonstrate beyond a shadow of a doubt why you are the best possible partner to that ideal client that you're trying to sell. So how do you create a sales funnel? Well, let's look at what goes into it. The top of the funnel is a marketing function. So here we can do things called IBM and ABM. And I apologize, I'm a marketing guy, so I speak in a lot of acronyms, but I'll, I'll clarify each one as we hit it. IDM stands for Integrated Direct Marketing. Essentially, we're going to think about creating a multi-step sequence of, of activities, multiple touches, using multiple channels of communication. We'll use email. We'll use LinkedIn messaging. We'll pick up the phone. We may use physical mail, snail mail, packages. We may use social media beyond LinkedIn. I know more and more people are using WhatsApp. So we're going to create these multi-step, multi-channel, structured sequence of activities that shows salespeople how to go after a prospect. The ADA model is inherently built into that integrated direct marketing campaign. And then there's ABM campaigns, which stands for account-based marketing, which now it's sort of like the IDM. You're going to have a structured sequence of activities, but with account-based marketing, you're personalizing what you do for an individual prospect. So I can, I can tell you a quick story on this one. So there was a client of ours in, uh, in Minnesota and they were trying to break into a company that manufactured ammunition. This was a, a big company. They had something like 800 temps on site. And our client had never had any success getting the time, attention, getting the interest of this particular manufacturing company. But our client noticed that the manufacturing company had recently been acquired and they thought maybe this would be an opportunity to break in. So they worked with us to do some research and we learned that for the, the parent company that had done the acquisition, this was their first acquisition in the state of Minnesota. And through more research, we learned that the, the acquiring company was really more of like a venture fund holding company and they were buying lots and lots of people in and around the sporting goods industry. And what we really were surprised to learn is that in this holding company to making the investments, there were only four people, the president, a CFO, and two administrative people. 
So we ended up talking to our client about, well, how can we do something just for this prospect? This particular account, we said, we have to go after the president. There's only four people. That's our decision maker. What are we going to do to make sure we get that person's attention? And we said, I know. Came up with this. Let's send them a gift basket. Welcome to Minnesota. And we asked our client, go source a whole bunch of things from your state that would be native to the state and fun to receive. So they got some candy. They got a bunch of other items to go in this gift basket and a beautiful tabletop book with pictures all around the state of Minnesota. And we made this nice package that was sent via FedEx to the president of this company. And it was just a card. Welcome to Minnesota. We just heard this, you made your first acquisition in our state. Uh, we're a large local employer and we're excited to see you here. Simple. Then about a week later, they sent a package to this president again. And this package said, we know a little bit about the company you've acquired. They do a lot of temporary staffing. But to our knowledge, they're not really using a strategic staffing approach to workforce management. And there are ways to staff differently that could better help manage the costs and productivity in the plant. And you know, when you get here, we'd love to talk with you about it if it's of any interest. Now, there was supposed to be a third communication in the stream where this company actually sent a piece that said, and by the way, here's who we are and here's our capabilities and what we do. Never even got to piece three. After piece two, the president of this acquiring company called the president of the staffing company and said, you know, thank you so much for the gift basket. That was very thoughtful. My kids love the treats. There's a win. We got, you know, anytime you make somebody's kids happy, that's a win. And the, the book was beautiful. I can't wait to get up there and see what's going on there. Also, I read the second piece with this approach to strategic staffing that you're suggesting. And I'm really intrigued in talking with you further about this. Uh, I can't wait till we get up there. Let's schedule a meeting. So this is an example of account-based marketing. They did their homework. They figured out the backstory behind the company they were trying to reach. They figured out how to connect with this person. And then they built a campaign, multiple touches in a sequence to go after this specific, in this case, one person. Now, usually with account-based marketing, you're targeting multiple decision makers at the same time in an organization, not just one. But in this case, it worked really well targeting this one. There's a little footnote to this that we didn't learn until after we did this campaign. The, uh, the current incumbent staffing company was owned by the brother of our client. I cannot imagine what Thanksgiving dinner was like at their house after uh, they went after one of their biggest clients. All right, so that's integrated direct marketing, a structured, systematic approach to selling, and account-based marketing is just personalizing it for individual prospects. Then there's creating a digital marketing system. I'll show you that in a little bit later, but that's using all the things, search engine optimization, pay-per-click advertising, content creation, your website and funnel building, to generate more inbound sales leads. So I'll show you that in a little bit. So top of funnel content, I'm not going to read you all these bullets. The slides will be available on our lunchwithhaley.com website. If you haven't already downloaded them, you can get them there. But at the top of the funnel, you're thinking educational information that may be directly or indirectly tied to staffing, but is more about the pain points, the problems, the customer, your ideal client is facing. Then we get to the middle of the funnel. This is still more marketing. Here we have drip campaigns. This is the ongoing nurturing. We're going to do something to stay top of mind with every prospect, ideally at least once a month, sometimes more frequently. And we want to do it in a way that's not annoying. We're not constantly selling, but we're repeatedly delivering value. We're making deposits into that bank account that Jim Cecil talked about. We're going to do things like blogging and email and print publications, podcasting, webinars, but here we're getting more staffing and hiring focused. We're starting to demonstrate how what you do for a living is a tool to solve the problems you know your ideal client has. So again, lots of different types of content that you can put into the mix here, but now you're starting to show people how to use staffing more effectively than they may be using it today. You're starting to do things like case studies that illustrate for other businesses, just like the people we're calling on, here's how staffing works for them. And then we get to the bottom of the funnel, and now it's supporting the sales team. Sales team's doing its job, so we need to help them close more of those prospects. We need to provide social proof, testimonials, even better, video testimonials, online reviews, 
logos of companies you work with. Sometimes you may even provide purchasing incentives. Now, I'm not a big fan of discounting as a purchasing incentive. Uh, I think it cheapens the value of your services, but there might be reasons to act now. Maybe there's a something that you could throw in. Maybe there's a training program or a custom orientation program for all the new hires that you're going to send to this company. There's ways to increase the value of your service delivery and use that as a purchase incentive. And here I've got a long list of ideas. So again, lunchwithhaley.com, get the slides, get the whole list, but you're thinking about every touch point sales has with a prospect. How can we make those touch points more impactful? All right, and that brings us to better marketing, which is our third strategy for today. Right on time, we got about 15 minutes left to, to get through better marketing and have some time for Q&A. So marketing is about giving salespeople the support they need in advance of selling, during the sales process, and after selling to keep you top of mind. So we got this really complicated graphic. Now, this is a graphic we use internally at Haley Marketing. It helps our team know where a lot of the things we do for a living fit into helping our clients. But I wanted to share this with you today because if you look at the top, the gold you're trying to generate is increased sales leads. Then there's two main strategies. Sales, helping people be more productive with calls, networking, in-mail or other social messaging, and then generating inbound leads. Below those two bars. There's ways to help the sales team be more productive. That's all the green. There's improving the sales process and improving the sales tools. <clears throat> and underneath there, you'll see lots of different ideas. We've talked about IDM campaigns and ABM campaigns. Automation, you'll see in there. There's lots of ways now to use automation to create sequences to take the integrated direct marketing and make it very structured. It sends the emails automatically. It tells salespeople when to make calls. It tracks the results. There's ways to create better collateral as part of the bottom of the funnel to help salespeople better tell your story, to tell it more consistently, to illustrate your value. And then lots of different ways to nurture relationships to stay top of mind. Now, again, some of the things in here won't make sense to you if you're just seeing reading this because there are specific things like Haley Mail. That's a product we have. So don't worry about that. But just know that you need to think about how can we help salespeople have a process that's more productive by making their outbound sales activities as productive as possible, by making their sales calls productive as possible, by keeping you top of mind. Then improving the tools. What can we give our team so that they can sell better to, to use in their sales process? Automation is one. You're going to notice that automation is not here lots of different times. Video email. Video e email gets double the open rates of standard email. So are you incorporating video into your email outreach? Asynchronous selling. People are really busy. Nobody has 15 minutes for a meeting. So we can now let people buy at their own convenience by doing things asynchronously, one way at a time. We've always done asynchronous selling when we sent people an email. Hey, read this and get back to me. That's asynchronous. But now in the sales process, we might create videos and landing pages that allow people to consume your content, your information at their own convenience. They can watch a webinar on demand. They can read about your company through the sales collateral you share. They can even go through maybe your proposal where you would do a video walking them through your recommendations and have a scheduled meeting just to do Q&A. Asynchronous selling saves your customers time and makes it easier to buy from you. Then on the inbound lead gen, the number one thing you can look at is your website. Are we doing everything we can to maximize conversions? Typically on staffing websites, about 60% of the people coming to your website leave without doing anything. Like they leave without even going to a second page. And more than 90% of visitors never fill out a form. So are there things we can do to increase response? You'll see an acronym, CRO, Conversion Rate Optimization. Are we doing things to make sure as many people as possible respond? Are we testing different offers and different wording? Do we even have different offers on the site? Are we building landing pages that are single purpose pages designed to get people to take action? Do we have a chatbot that makes it easy for people to respond to you 24 seven? And some of the new AI based chatbots are really cool because it allows the, the bot to answer questions in a much more human natural language format than just a scripted, are you looking for a job? Are you looking to hire kinds of Q and A? Um, retargeting pay-per-click advertising, having ads follow people around because when a prospect comes back to your website a second time, they're twice as likely to become a client. And then we can do 
things to get found. This is where traditional digital marketing comes into play. And then the last two events and OPS, OPS stands for other people's stages, are there ways to get in front of your clients more easily at events like trade conferences or meetups, or even an event you might put on at a, right within a client's office or in your local community. Events can be in the real world, they can be virtual events, but anytime you're at an event, you can choose to just attend, you can sponsor, you can exhibit, or best, best of all is you can move over to that gray OPS and you can become a speaker. Because when you're a speaker, you're in front of your target audience and you're instantly seen as an expert, you have credibility. And that makes it easier to sell. And then the OPS, there's, it doesn't just mean get on stage because a lot of people don't want to be on stage, but you could be a, on a webinar like we're doing right now. You could be a guest on a podcast. You could write a blog post for somebody else's website. You could actually just do press releases that get your information into your target industry because every industry has trade associations and those trade associations are always looking for good sources of content. So better marketing, where to focus. If I was going to start with most companies, you're going to look at collateral. Do the salespeople have what they need to tell your story? Does the website need to be upgraded? Are there opportunities to improve the content, the calls to action, the conversion rate optimization? Do we have nurturing campaigns, something to keep us top of mind at least once a month? Are we doing the retargeting paid advertising, knowing that every time we can get somebody to come back, we double the chance of making a sale? Are we using lead tracking so we can see who's coming to our website? What companies are there? And then we can marry lead tracking with other platforms to go right back into integrated direct marketing to the people visiting your website. Are we using video email to increase our response to our email communications? And are we using some form of asynchronous selling to make it more convenient for people to buy from us? All right, I promised to show you this quick overview of a digital marketing system. So how do you put all these digital marketing tools together to get inbound leads? Well, digital marketing system doesn't start with social media or SEO or paid advertising. It starts with your website. And do we have as many ways possible for people to take action? Action when they're ready to buy. Action when they want to learn more. Action when they're just interested in ideas. So do we have landing pages? Do we have offers? Have we optimized the site for response? Is it integrated with our ATS or our CRM system? Are we producing content regularly? It's gonna help you rank, or Google loves content, but content is about positioning. Are we writing stuff that positions ourselves the way we want to be seen? Is it telling the right stories? And content can come in all kinds of formats, blogs, articles, white papers, videos, podcasts. Are we using search engine optimization to get found by people who are looking for us? Not just for best staffing company in my local city, but looking for answers to the problems they're having, the questions they're asking about your services, because we're developing content that answers questions so it gets found by search engines. Are we using paid advertising to get found online and drive people to the website? Are we using social media to reach people who might not know us? And are, are we using reach email marketing to stay top of mind with people who do know us and have opted in to receive it? Do we have formal referral partnerships with maybe it's with our associates, maybe it's with even our clients or former clients, maybe it's with industry influencers who will refer business to us. And then are we doing things when somebody visits the site to bring them back? The retargeting ads that we talked about, ads that follow people around and marketing automation so that it's somebody who engages with your website will have a follow-up sequence that will continue to engage them and bring them back again and again and again. And all of these pieces fit together to create this digital marketing system to drive inbound lead gen. All right, so let's kind of get to the end here. Let's go back to our story. What happened to that company in Memphis, Tennessee? So this company made a commitment in a market that was down, more down than the market is today. They developed the right story. They integrated marketing into their sales process. They got aggressive with their digital marketing. They made a conscious decision to win their local market, to really dominate. So was it an instant roaring success? Nope, it actually wasn't. In fact, revenue continued to fall in the beginning of 2010. The market was down 30% coming out of 2009 and nothing we did was an instant fix. But this company didn't give up. They kept their foot on the gas pedal. They kept marketing. They kept selling. And they, they were incredibly persistent. 
about six months later, their decline stopped. In fact, it stopped six months before the staffing industry turned around and we started to see growth again after the Great Recession. And this company grew at twice the rate of growth of the staffing industry. And that accelerated pace of growth continued the next year and the next year and the next year. They had built a stronger brand. They had positioned themselves with their ideal clients. They had made themselves the trusted spear removal surgeons to the people they wanted to reach. And what happened is it drew, excuse me, it drove multi-year growth for their business. So my final question, how about you? Are you ready to 10X your sales with better marketing? Can you support your sales team? Can you create a better strategy? a better process and better marketing support to help your salespeople be 10 times more productive. Because when you integrate marketing and sales, it's exactly what you can get is a significant increase in sales productivity. So one more word from dad. So one of the things my dad always said to me, he said to people in his staffing company is to win in a recession. And we're not in a recession, but we are in a downturn for the staffing industry. We have to make the economy the other guy's problem. It's a decision. You can choose to go down with the market. You can choose to outwork, outthink, outhustle your competitors. And you can choose to continue to thrive even in the most challenging economies. So a couple of freebies for you just to wrap things up. Um, if you liked today's presentation, you like the ideas, and you're not already subscribed to our weekly newsletter called the Smart Ideas Weekly. It comes out every Saturday morning, 9 a.m. Eastern time is when we send it out. Um, you can use that QR code or just go to haleymarketing.com forward slash Smart Ideas Weekly. And every week we share one specific tip on sales and marketing and recruiting for the staffing industry. Next offer is uh, if you have not already downloaded our latest ebook or didn't pick it up at a conference, get a copy. It's got 33 ideas, strategies, process improvements, marketing tactics, and training ideas to help you sell more effectively in this economy. It's totally free to get, and we're not going to harass you just because you download something. We're big on giving away ideas. Uh, our belief is the more the staffing industry succeeds, the better it is for all of us. And as they said at the Staffing Industry Executive Forum, we're going to see a lot of overall growth in staffing, which means everybody's due for an increase in their business. But you need to use the right strategies to get in front of that. So use that QR code. And if you don't feel like taking out your phone, you can just jot down haleymarketing.com forward slash make an impact. And you can get it from the same website URL. Now, on that landing page, in addition to the ebook, there's a special offer. And I want to just repeat one of the ones that's there because some of you may want to get some help. So if you would like our team to help put together some ideas for what you can do differently to make your sales and marketing stand out, we're doing free roadmaps. And it's about a, about a two-hour project, about a $560 value for us to do this for you. And it's completely free of charge and there's no obligation. But we are happy to talk with you about what you're trying to accomplish who your ideal customer is, what you're doing today, and what we can suggest as areas for improvement. So you can go to that same landing page, the hillymarketing.com forward slash make an impact or that QR code, and just click a button and fill in your name and address. And we will be more than happy to reach out and schedule a time to do that for you. All right. And I believe my very last slide is, and I will stay on, we've got a little time for questions, but also if you can join us, in just a few more weeks, um, next month, we're going to be doing our Lunch with Haley webinar with practical strategies to improve candidate quality and quantity. And Matt Lozar from our recruitment marketing team is going to lead the discussion where we're looking at what you can do to get the highest quality talent to fill your open job orders. And with that said, thank you very much for being part of today's Lunch with Haley webinar. I will check the Q&A and see what we have and go over anything. All right, so there was a question about that story. How did they guarantee a higher performing employee? So I'm gonna go back to that story. What this company had was a really good candidate screening and client management process. It took a lot of work to make sure they got it right. 
and took a, a lot of planning for what they would do if something went wrong. Because, you know, you're never going to be perfect. But it was about having thought through how to consistently provide higher caliber talent and how to respond when you're not perfect or you have, you know, because you're dealing with people. They may not always perform the way they did in the interview, how you respond to them. So ja Jacqueline, that, I mean, that's what they did to guarantee it is they had a better process and system in place that allowed them to guarantee that they would provide better performing talent. And they check with the client. And if the client said, no, this is not as good, they replace the person. Much as most of you would if you needed to. All right. I don't see any other questions right now. So I'll leave that up. There's a couple things in the chat. Let me just see if there's anything there. Other than that, thank you uh, very much for joining us for today's webinar. And I hope to see you again at a future Lunch with Haley event. Take care now.